Field, uh, affectionately known as Boss, has been covering the uh, software sector for telecom for about uh, 18 or 19 years. Uh, Virgo Publishing bought it uh, four years ago, and we've been uh, running it ever since. And I'm the editor in chief, as, as you said. And uh, my my background also includes uh, a 14 year stint in the uh, service provider sector. I worked for AT and T uh, and Ameritech, both on the landline and wireless side. And uh, and that's about it. Great. And uh, next, next on the agenda is Nava. Nava Levy calling in all the way from Israel. Uh, she's the VP of Cloud Services at CVidia. Nava, how are you doing this morning? Good. Thank you, Kyle. Great. And so why don't you, uh, can you just give us a quick introduction on, on your background and, and your expertise in this area? Um, yes. Uh, in uh, CVidia, I'm leading uh, the SaaS uh, cloud efforts. And uh, before that, I was in Amdocs. Uh, uh, for quite a long time, I was uh, leading there the cloud uh, software as a service program. Um, essentially, I, um, I have more than a decade experience, uh, specifically in telecom, uh, from Cividia, from Amdocs, from uh, ECI Telecom, which is a network equipment provider. Uh, and in the past, uh, I would say four or five years, I've been dealing with uh, this amazing thing called cloud computing. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Uh, so uh, I, I love I love that uh, that phrasing of cloud computing. Um, so I, I worked in the cloud computing space for a while as well. Um, I ran uh, marketing for or some of the uh, the product lines over at Salesforce.com for about five years, and recently joined up at Zawara. And if, if you're not familiar with Zawara, we are uh, one of the leaders in subscription billing and overall uh, cloud subscription management. And we'll get into a little bit more detail about how our solutions all work together later in the presentation. But what I wanted to start with is actually uh, have Tim kind of go into a discussion of what's happening in the communications industry today. It's really an industry in, in a state of constant change, and uh, Tim has some fantastic thoughts about, uh, you know, overall what, what's going on at the, at the market level. So, Tim, I'll pass it over to you and, uh, and have you share your, your thoughts on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd also like to thank the folks, the rest of the folks at Zora uh, and Suvidia for letting me participate. I'd also say that it's a pretty exciting time in communications, you know, as we move into the 4G environment. But then, what would I say about the introduction to 3G, you know, or the transformation of the cable companies into communications companies, or the transformation of communications companies into media companies? You know, what could I say about the, the bubble burst in 2000, 2001, or, or Y2K itself? <laughs> you know, it's, they've all been pretty exciting times in telecom, and just as often they've been potentially harmful times also for traditional telecom companies. Uh, so you might think that the more things change, the more they appear the same. It's one exciting innovation after another, and one big competitive challenge after another. So take this first quote here, uh, for instance, which pretty much sums up a uh, competitive environment. It says, this is an era in which service providers must adapt to change rather than force the iron will of past monopolies down the throat of an industry and customer base that will no longer swallow it. The thing is that that was written by my good friend and uh, old boss over at Telephony uh, in 1997. And it's describing the position that ILEX found themselves in when the CLEX were trying to eat their lunch. And the ILEX survived that period pretty much unscathed. And that's kind of the problem. Because they survived the CLEX wars, they survived the VoIP wars basically, and the, and the cable assault, even though they've lost some market share. And they may view this cloud transition and the over-the-top phenomenon as just another new trend that they can fend off. But I think that this time it's different. I think the changes occurring today with over-the-top providers and uh, a new cloud infrastructure pose some real serious threats to telecom service providers. Uh, and there's another quote that kind of spells that out from CTIA just this May. And that's with over-the-top Competitors like Apple, Amazon, and Google, uh, and even handset manufacturers trampling over the wireless operator's relationship with their own subscribers, the operators do risk rapid erosion in market positioning and with 
and uh, you know, with that could be relegated to uh, dumb pipe status. And uh, you know, the new players mentioned here, they have just as much or more money and more young internet bred minds that the telecom service provider. And the strategies that got the service providers through those other challenges uh, may not work this time. Uh, next slide. So the good thing for service providers is that they appear to know that it is different this time. And they know that their biggest problem is bringing new services to market as fast or faster than their competition. And in a report issued in May by Infinetics Research, it showed that service providers have identified new service introduction as their number one driver for investing in service delivery solutions. But they're going to have to move pretty fast <laughs> because, uh, you know, Shira Levine, the Informatics BFS OSS analyst there, said that it is still currently taking about 12 to 15 months to introduce new services, and that just won't do. Now, she also said the cloud-based service creation and delivery can help them lower that time frame significantly. So I'm no analyst, but it makes me wonder whether they should be investing in service delivery platforms at all unless those platforms are uh, utilizing the cloud. Yeah, Tim, you know, that's, really, that's really interesting that, that 12 to 15 month time frame right, is, you know, probably five years ago or, or 10 years ago, if you talk to a communication service provider about that time frame, they'd say, yeah, that, that feels about right, that feels pretty good. Uh, but if you contrast that with the amount of time that it takes the companies that you listed on your previous slide, you know, the Googles of the world, to release a new service, it's 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 a pretty stark difference. You know, Google's cranking out new services, uh, you know, on a weekly or monthly basis uh, versus this 12 to 15 month cycle. Right, absolutely, and that, you know that can't continue. That 12 to 15 months is uh, it's improved a little bit, but uh, and for some services, you know, to be honest, they've been able to roll some things out pretty fast. But overall, uh, you know, that has to improve significantly. So. And a lot of other people are probably wondering the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Because, you, know, you know, Analysis Mason, they put their numbers out on how much they expect that cloud to grow. Uh, and they're saying they're giving a compound annual growth rate of like 22% uh, through to 2016. You know, so uh, that's faster, than, faster growth than just about anybody else. So hopefully the volatility of the market in the last few weeks won't put the kibosh on that. So going to the cloud should help that service delivery. Uh, yeah, certainly. Effort. So, okay. All right. so as you can see on this next slide, uh, there's some pretty wild growth expected for some of the business models that are to be realized in the cloud. Uh, and every analyst describes their market segments a little differently. Uh, so they have different figures, but both Instat and the IDC show spectacular growth for software as a service. And IDC has it growing from $16 billion, which they say it reached in uh, last year, to $53.6 billion by 2015. Uh, infrastructure of service and platform as a service are also expected to do equally well uh, with triple-digit growth. And one of the elements of cloud computing we'll be talking about here today, which is billing. Uh, it's the one element without with, without which all this cloud effort uh, is, is meaningless, basically, because you have to monetize your services. Uh, and that's expected to grow from $15 billion that it got its start at in 2008 to $350 million in, a, in a couple of years. So uh, next slide. So it's more than just analyst projections, uh, which are good, but they're subject to market conditions, and you've seen recently how volatile that is. Uh, but the operators themselves are putting money, their money, where their cloud strategy is. And the M&A activity around cloud has been pretty telling, uh, as you will hear more about later. But the industry pretty well put was put on notice that service writers are taking cloud seriously when Verizon announced the acquisition of Terramark for $1.4 billion. But other companies have sounded the bell as well. CA, uh, on the vendor side, has spent the last two years and about a billion dollars building its cloud portfolio. 
and Time Warner Cable got into the act with its acquisition of Navisite for $230 million. And then CenturyLink topped off its Quest acquisition by buying Savis, a cloud center company, for $2.5 billion. And even the rural markets got into it uh, when they made it their move with Warwick Valley bought Altiva. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, the markets uh, have not been good, and uh, just the cloud sector itself saw a 10% drop in their valuation uh, the week ending August 5th. Uh, so, but volatility or not, you know, the interest in the cloud remains high, and as you can see on this next slide, uh, that the you know the interest in cloud at the Boss Live conference in June for those who weren't there was sky high. And you probably can't read this, but uh, on your right-hand side, that's our agenda from the conference. And it just shows that the first day and a half of that conference, we had six sessions on cloud. And we started off with a reality check. Um, and then we had some sessions for people just starting to consider cloud, one that focused on charging and billing, another for revenue assurance, and uh, one on differentiating services in the cloud. And that was just the first day and a half. And we thought, well, we're a BSS OSS show. Maybe we're overdoing the cloud topic. But it turns out that that wasn't even enough. You know, there's still so much to learn about how to deliver cloud services successfully and profitably that uh, we could have done a whole track on it. And there's few companies as well positioned as Zawara and CVIDIA to talk about the cloud and uh, issues like billing and charging. So. Uh, I think I'll hand it over to them to let them uh, give you their point of view. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I really appreciate that. And, you know, we had some folks uh, from from Zora on site at the GSS OSS conference, and you know, I, I just echo your sentiments. The cloud was kind of at the top of mind for for just about everybody that we spoke with. Uh, Nava, I know that in you know, as your background, you've been in this space uh, quite a long time, and I think you had some some interesting insights and and had some similar thoughts as Tim with, with respect to. Uh, you know, carriers needing to innovate in, in terms of the, the service that, that they want to deliver. I know Tim had the quote on one of his slides about, you know, you want to at all costs avoid becoming um, the dumb pipes, right? I think your perspective was you know, the vision ought to be that, you know, you, that carriers ought to aspire to become the long tail provider. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, I see, I see similar things. I think that the um, uh, telco service providers who will uh, thrive in this uh, new era, as Tim mentioned, uh, will need to provide one-stop shop ICT for their business customers. Now, in terms of cloud or software as a service services, they will become the long-tail providers. Now, when we say long-tail providers, we refer to e-tailers as Amazon, who reach most niches by carrying a very broad and di diverse assortment. It's no more one uniform service to 40 million subscribers. It's a lot of uh, um, services uh, to all ki to many niches, and uh, this is very different from what we are used to. And the reason that um, service providers are, are, are doing it and are going to do it more, to more extent, is that it will allow them to move up the value chain to offer not just communication services, but also IT services. Uh, and in doing that, they will they will counter voice decline, they will reduce churn, and ultimately, as Tim said, avoid becoming a dump pipe. Now, this model is also referred to cloud service uh, brokerage. Uh, probably some of you heard of it. And it refers to uh, who, is, uh, who owns those services uh, and who delivers them. And, and essentially, those many services that are going to be uh, delivered to, to the business customers and also consumers uh, are not all going to be owned by the communication service providers. Many of them are going to uh, be delivered uh, from SaaS, third party SaaS cloud service providers, and this is going uh, to make things a little bit more uh, complex uh, but more satisfying for the end customers. Now, Verizon calls this a, a strategy everything as a service cloud strategy when it acquired the uh, Terramark uh, several months ago. Next slide. So obviously, you know, we see today uh, service providers launching uh, many SaaS cloud services. Just yesterday, uh, Sprint announced uh, its uh, cloud uh, service initiatives. 
um, but but for the future, you know, a not so distant future, we are going to see uh, many more uh, such uh, cloud services, and a single uh, service provider will offer hundreds and probably thousands or more of ever-changing services across TAS, PaaS, and YAS, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and this. These services are not going to be uniform mass services, uh, particularly, but they are going to address every niche. So they are going to be vertical specific apps. They are going to be localized, personalized across uh, the laptop, the iPad, and, uh, and, and, the, lap and the smartphone. Uh, they will need to support many frequently changing and innovative pricing models. And as I said, uh, not all of them are going to be owned by the service providers, but uh, will be uh, delivered to third-party uh, SaaS cloud um, uh, vendors, and the subscriber uh, or the customer who is going to subscribe to these services, he will expect to see one bill in that includes all the services uh, he or she subscribed to, uh, bundled with discounts, and not just the, the SaaS cloud services, but together with the communication services, and the same password that he used to access the Salesforce application, he will expect to use when you access the WebEx application. Um, and not, it's not just that, which is complicated enough, it, it also means competing with the Google and the Amazon of this world, who excel in delivering uh, these businesses as uh, low margin businesses. Uh, so this is a challenging from a number of aspects. Monetization uh, is one of the key ones. And when we say monetization, we mean billing for these services, but also preventing revenue leakage and fraud in order to assure their margins. Yeah, completely agree, Nava. Um, and so, you know, so what we've seen so far, we, we've had Tim talk about the, the pure necessity uh, for telcos to really start launching new services. We've heard Nava echo the same sentiments, whether you're uh, launching you know, new SaaS services or PaaS services or infrastructure as a service offerings. Um, even even new media services that we're seeing people start to roll out. Um, you're competing in an environment where uh, your competitors are, are no longer other service providers, but companies like Amazon or Google or Apple. And the, the challenge in operating with that environment is that, unfortunately, for a lot of CSPs who have been in the market for so long, is that the infrastructure that they have, the underlying tools that they're using as a business to support these new initiatives, it just wasn't built to operate uh, in this new world. It wasn't designed for these new services, and it wasn't designed to, to move at Internet type speed. Right? And so, you know, the, the companies we talk to, um, they literally have technology platforms that date back 20, 30 years. And that was great when your core business was made up of, you know, just on pure uh, voice services or, or pure data services. Right? You, ha you have all the features you need to focus on intra of billing. Uh, but if you want to focus on cloud usage billing, uh, you know, it's going to take you, you know, six to nine months just to customize that application to, to help you do that. Um, speed is another angle. And so if you look at HTC, they can crank out new Android devices in three months. Every three months there's a new device on the market. Uh, but if you want to roll out you know, billing and, and uh, revenue management for your new mobile cloud service, it's going to take you 18 months. Uh, and there's also the, this, this construct of the way that uh, customers want to interact with you as a business today. And uh, you know, the, the old days, it was all about calling the call center. And um, that's what a lot of the, the older CRM platforms are designed for, really around the call center, versus the way that customers want to interact with you today, which is largely around mobile devices and the web. And this is, I, I've got a, a quote that I love on the screen here from a news, news article or, or a blog that I found, and uh, I hate to pick on poor Clearwire, but I think that the headline really sums it up nicely, which is, you know, they spent $100 million on a new Amdocs implementation, and all they got out of it was a lousy T-shirt. So it, the, the point is that um, just the, the speed, the dollar amounts that are involved, the level of effort that's involved to implement what's traditionally been the, the, uh, a leading platform uh, in telco, it, it really just doesn't work in this day and age when everyone's clawing and, and fighting with each other to, to race to market with, with new SaaS offerings or new cloud offerings. And so what's the solution? Well, the solution is you need a platform. You need a, an infrastructure that's going to support these new types of services. And so if there's a bleak outlook when you're looking at older on-premise technologies, uh, really there's a promising future in cloud computing, not only as a service that you can sell as a service provider, but as the infrastructure that is going to take you there uh, at the speed and with the flexibility that you need uh, to be successful. And so Tim had a lot of similar stats on uh, his slides, but the, the, the truth is really undeniable that the market for cloud technologies is exploding. 
Um, and IDC some, offers some my favorite statistics, which says that you know by next year, uh, about 85% of net new software firms coming to market are going to be built around software as a service. And we see that here in Silicon Valley, where uh, you know you talk to the venture capital firms, uh, they're not funding anyone who's, who's delivering on-premise software anymore. It's really uh, it's cloud or bust. And IDC also says that by 2014, about two-thirds of new products, even from established ISVs, are going to be delivered as software as a service offerings. And so this is great for if you're if you're a telco, uh, because just about everything you need these days is available as a cloud service, whether it's billing, whether it's CRM, device management, ERP, financials, fraud, order management, revenue assurance, sales, SLA. Um, there are technologies out there that you can use uh, that are built on these new cloud computing platforms, which are faster to deploy, more cost effective, and easier to use. And so one of those is is an offering uh, from CVIDIA. So uh, Nava, you know, we know fraud management is, is a critical element for telcos as they're thinking about their overall rev revenue strategies and, and monetization of their customers. We'd love to hear from you a little bit about exactly what you guys do and why you decided that uh, cloud was, was a great platform for you to uh, extend uh, your offerings on. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Um, so why is fraud management a solution any provider uh, launching new services needs? The reason is that fraud in telecom is a huge problem. On average, 4.5% of revenues are lost to fraud. This is uh, $80 billion globally. Now, this is not just the financial uh, implication. It also adversely affects customer satisfaction. Imagine, you know, receiving a bill that is 10 times larger than the usual. And also, uh, uh, it's bad for the service provider's public image. In addition, when we talk about launching next-gen services, cloud services, we, we, we realize that there are new types of fraud and new fraud risks which are different, more, sometimes more sophisticated and greater than the traditional fraud. Now, for smaller service providers, the problem is even worse. This, the reason is that they, these service providers just can't afford to deploy robust commercial fraud management systems. They don't have the budget, they don't have the re IT resource to implement them, to, to maintain them, to upgrade them. Now, homegrown solution tools are not nearly as effective, and as a result, fraudsters who are really very sophisticated criminals are targeting specifically these smaller service providers because of the, that they know of their vulnerabilities. So uh, the result is that while the average uh, of revenue loss in the industry is 4.5% for smaller service providers, this is much uh, higher. Now, this is bad for uh, any type of service, but especially for next-gen and cloud services that already uh, are, um, come with, uh, you know, from start with low margin business. So you can't uh, afford to lose 5% for Ford, not even 2% for Ford. And really this is the reason that we launched FordView Cloud. Next slide. So what is FordView Cloud? FordView Cloud enables service providers to combat all common four types across traditional, next-gen, and cloud services in order to substantially reduce fraud losses. By leveraging the cloud model, FordView Cloud is available at an affordable monthly subscription fee without the need to invest or install hardware or software. In addition, ongoing free updates allow service providers and also smaller service providers to always stay ahead of the fraud game with the latest features and best practices. Now, this is uh, in a very high level. The next slide has a list of the key capabilities and benefits of FordView Cloud. And really, the benefits are a combination of, on the one hand, a leading uh, best of breed fraud management system, the FordView, and the cloud, leveraging the cloud model. So, FordView Cloud is a, a powerful fraud management solution that includes comprehensive fraud detection engines mature alarm and case management workflow, a rich and intuitive web GUI with advanced inv investigation and reporting tools. With this set of capabilities, service providers can effectively combat virtually any type of fraud and for any type of service, traditional, next-gen, and cloud services. But FordView Cloud, as we said, is not just powerful. By leveraging the cloud model, with its pay-as-you-go pricing, it is extremely affordable, promising a very quick return on investment. Now, FordView Cloud is just one application of Cvidia Cloud, our umbrella of on-demand revenue intelligence solutions. Next slide. So, um, 
the Civitia Cloud umbrella spans fraud management, revenue assurance, dealer management, margin analytics, among other applications. And the benefits is that by leveraging the cloud mo model, we are able to offer our customers today market-leading and market-proven applications that are also with fast time to market and with affordable pay-as-you-go pricing. The ongoing free updates makes the solution future-proof. And so this is, this is about the video cloud and for view cloud. And Kyle, I'll hand over to you to talk about other BSS OSS applications in the cloud. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Nava. It's it's interesting. I, I I see in the way that you guys position your service some of this, the same things that that, uh, that we hear from our customers, right? Who who are looking for billing solutions, which is that um, listen, I need something that's fast. I need something that's future proof. I need something that's uh, you know just as powerful as, as something I would get from an on-premise solution, but I, it needs to be more affordable. Uh, and, and I need to be able to trust it, which is, I'm sure, the reasons why you guys started investing. Uh, you know, I know you, you offer on-premise technology as well, but the reason why uh, uh, also you see in the slides that I showed earlier that something like 65% of even established ISVs are going to be offering cloud services over the next few years. Yeah. And so um, uh, Zora is, is another provider who's, who's into the space. And so we were a company who uh, were founded by – uh, really executives from, from some of the, the, the earliest and, and now most established software as a service companies out there. So our CEO and founder was employee number 11 at salesforce.com, and we've since been joined by executives from NetSuite and Netflix and PayPal and WebEx. And our vision is really to build uh, the next great uh, billing and commerce platform uh, in the cloud. And so we're, we're uh, do business with folks in all sorts of industries, but we have a, definitely a focus in the communications industry. And we've been working with um, some what we call kind of pioneers in, in the telco space, uh, all the way from, from, from small companies like Elevate Communications, who's a small company out of Southern California, all the way up to Tata Communications, who's one of the largest uh, comms providers in, in the world globally based out of India who really see the cloud as their platform of choice for their infrastructure going forward. And so uh, in addition to, to all the fraud management capabilities that Nava spoke about, uh, billing and customer care have also moved to the cloud. And this is really how we go to market. Uh, we've chosen to partner with Salesforce.com in our offering because we see really billing and, and uh, the whole relationship management aspect as being pretty uh, pretty linked intrinsically together, uh, and you, you can see this, you know, in a, in a um, more academic sense when you think about, oh yeah, you know, ultimately if you own billing, you own the relationship with the customer. But even if you, your own experiences, now when you pick up the phone and you're calling a call center to get a, a question answered, you know, 80, 90 percent of the time it's because you have a billing question. So, so these two applications are, are really uh, made for one another, and that's why we've chosen to, to look at Salesforce.com, who has really established itself as a leader in cloud relationship management, uh, both on the sales side and the service side, and Zora, who is uh, over the last four years really established itself as, as one of the leaders in cloud billing and, and cloud pricing and cloud subscription management. And so together, uh, we have a joint solution. We call it Zora for Comms, and uh, this is a 100% multi-tenant solution, and, you know, no hardware, no software to install, fully integrated together. And what it lets you do is basically uh, define your services in any way you want to. And again, uh, Zora was designed with the idea that Comps providers are not going to be just rolling out traditional voice and data services, but really any type of service, especially as you see this convergence across communications and media and technology. And so uh, we give you a product catalog that lets you define your products based on one-time charges and usage-based charges and recurring charges and uh, really the flexibility to, to tweak your pricing uh, really as frequently as you want to. We spoke with the chief marketing officer over at one of our customers, Elevate, the other day, and you know, he said that the reason reason that he loves uh, this solution so much is because if he wants to roll out 20 different new pricing packages next week, he can do that. He can go in and point and click and configure and roll that out, and there's no way his competitors can keep up with that pace of change. And so once you've got your products defined, the next thing you want to be able to do is then get those things sold and manage those interactions with, with your customers uh, as they are uh, first becoming customers, as they are uh, buying services, as they are upgrading those services. So can you manage the quoting and the ordering process around uh, upgrades and downgrades and add-ons and, uh, and service requests that happen all in the middle? And then on the back end, of course, uh, do you have the rating capabilities to be able to take in usage data, uh, process the recurring payments and the one-time charges, and have it all come together in an invoice uh, that makes sense and present that invoice uh, back on the web or, or via uh, you know, traditional um, 
uh, paper invoices, whatever you need to do. And so the, the whole solution comes together really, really nicely. And that's why we're seeing adoption from folks like uh, Barrett. ExploreNet is, is one of our, our earliest customers. And if you haven't heard of Barrett, Barrett is rolling out Canada's first 4G wireless service uh, across rural parts of, of the country. It's now available to over 130,000 customers, 700 dealers across the country. And, and their strategy was, hey, if we're going to be successful rolling out this new service, we can't rely on traditional on-premise technology to help us do it. It's just going to be too expensive. It's going to take too long. And we're going to invest in cloud. And, and the, the quote that we heard from them was that we're, we're going wall-to-wall -wall cloud. And we're going to invest not only in Zora, but also in Salesforce.com. And we want uh, as little on-premise infrastructure as possible if we're going to move at the speed we need to move to launch this service first to market. And we heard something similar from Tata. So Tata, again, one of the largest communications providers in the world based out of India, uh, and they've got a huge Internet backbone, and they made a bunch of money selling uh, just pure data services. But what they realized, and you know, this touches on some of the things that Tim touched on earlier, is that pure data – going forward is not going to be enough. And so uh, Tata was uh, you know, a fast-moving company. They realized this, and they said, we're going to start to layer on services on top of our backbone. So we're going to launch a service that we call Tata InstaCompute, which is an infrastructure as a service uh, uh, service that you, that you can buy from them. And uh, we're going to launch that. We're going to launch a new video service and resell a service called BitGravity. Uh, we're going to resell Google apps, and we're going to brand that InstaOffice, and we want to sell this stuff. But what they realized was, if we're going to do this with our traditional infrastructure, uh, it's going to take us, our, our average go-to-market time is, is about two years using, using our, our traditional on-premise infrastructure that we've been using for the last few decades. And that's just not acceptable if we're going to roll out these new services and actually be competitive in the market. We need to go much, much faster. And so they said, we're going to invest in cloud to help us do it. We're going to invest in Zora and also Salesforce.com, uh, incidentally. And uh, they were able to t knock out the billing portion of this new InstaCompute service in only 60 days and cut their overall go-to-market time by half as they rolled this out. So huge, hugely successful for them, uh, and, and we congratulate them on their launch of that, that service. And so um, uh, hopefully at this point we've got some great perspective from all three of us, both Tim, Nava, and myself, uh, and I wanted to open the floor to questions. We have some that some uh, folks have emailed us ahead of time. I encourage you on the line uh, to go ahead and, and use the, the WebEx tool to, to fire in your questions, and we can get those answered of either Tim or Nava or myself. Uh, at this point, I want to turn it back over to, to Tim, if, Tim, if you're still on the line. Um, you know, any, any thoughts based on what you've heard from, from either Nava or, or myself relative to, to the information you presented at the, at the front half of the call? Well, a couple of things. You know, I, I find it interesting. Nava mentioned uh, among the many benefits of uh, uh, cloud services is you know something that gets mentioned once in a while, but I think it's a pretty big benefit, and that is the uh, the, the hassle-free, basically uh, upgrade process. You know that uh, you know, service for or users of software. Uh, you know, Really want a, more, a simplified process for for changes and upgrades, and uh, you know, I think this really supplies that. But one other thing that that, that struck me was that um, you know, service providers have learned through uh, customer service and bill payment that you know they have to support a lot of different options for their customers. You know, they're they're supporting e-bill, you know, like electronic bill payment. They're still doing print mail for their bills. You know, any way a customer wants to touch them, uh, they respond. They wind up supporting many, uh, many platforms. And uh, I, I just wonder whether uh, vendors who have a traditional platform now uh, are going to be at a disadvantage because as they start offering cloud-based solutions, whether they're going to have to, they'll be supporting two platforms at the same time, and that's that's, that's going to be a tricky for them. Yeah, so, so uh, we've got some questions coming in. We've got a question from uh, Gerben. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Gerben. Uh, Gerben wants to know, so what is it specifically about the cloud that allows you to uh, launch new price plans more quickly? Uh, why can't I do that with, with an on-premise solution? And so um, one, of the, one of the key benefits of a cloud solution is that it's, it's ever-evolving. Right? You install an on-premise application, and you get what comes out of the box 
and that's that. And that's what you have for the next 10 years, unless you want to go through one of those, you know, notorious upgrade processes that we all hear about where you've got to hire a, you know, a big systems integrator to come in and, and spend tens of millions of dollars to, to upgrade it. And, you know, one of the inherent advantages of a, of a true sort of multi-tenant cloud solution is that you get constant upgrades. And so uh, Zora, for example, we churn out new product features on a monthly basis that just become available in, in really just the same way that uh, when Google turns on new features in Gmail, uh, you just, they just become available to the end users. And so that means as uh, services evolve, as people come up with creative new ways to price their services, uh, you get the pricing engine, you get the, the billing engine to, and the capabilities around that uh, to be able to charge for those services. Now you contrast that with something, uh, you know, like uh, I, I won't I won't bash anybody, but a, a traditional kind of legacy billing platform that was built for long distance phone calls. Um, what happens when you try to customize that service? Uh, in order to resell a new SaaS application, for example. It just wasn't built for that. So you've got to spend all this time and money to customize it and roll it out. Um, or, uh, you know, if, if you're using a cloud solution, on the other hand, um, as new services become in vogue, you've got the capabilities uh, built in through monthly upgrades or whatever the frequency that your vendor is providing. Um, it, it's kind of an inherent in the platform. And I, I know, Nava, that's something you touched on as well, is, is being that those frequent updates is, is a real reason why people are moving to CVD Cloud as well. Yeah, this is uh, one of the key advantages, obviously, yes, yes. Great. Great. So, uh, so another question that's coming in is, um, so is this, you know, is this really just for uh, emerging telcos, or is this applicable to, to the large guys as well? Um, you know, Nabo, what's your, what's your stance on that? Okay, so, um, you know, the, the, the way that people look at, at cloud computing, software as a service, as a disruptive uh, innovation, is that, it's coming from the small guys, you know, the small telcos. The adoption is driven from there. But what we see is that it's not just the small service providers and the emerging uh, greenfield service providers. It's actually also very large service providers um, that are launching new innovative services, and they just can't wait in line uh, for other projects uh, for the IT to support, okay? Um, or they can't wait for traditional um, um, on on premise systems um, to deploy it's also coming from uh, small departments small departments that uh, are not uh, strategic as other departments but they have real needs and they need it now not in a year's time and they just uh, find it too frustrating uh, to wait and too the cost is too prohibitive so they find the cost and the time to market is a very uh, compelling uh, uh, features, you know, benefits of cloud computing to go to those providers. Yeah, we're, I'm seeing the same thing, actually. It's, um, you know, uh, of course the, the larger companies are going to be a little bit slower to move, but I see kind of two categories of folks who are adopting this stuff. It's, um, you know, if you're the, the smaller companies without being hindered by a legacy infrastructure, um, they're, of course, the, the first to kind of adopt new technologies. And just about every small provider we talk to um, doesn't want to have anything to do with, with on-premise technology. They're they're all about uh, you know going going wall-to-wall -wall cloud like like Barrett. Uh, but then you see the larger companies, uh, and it's usually you know the, the new division or uh, the new product line that needs to be launched. And and they're saying, hey, you know, we could use our legacy stuff, but it's really going to be just much faster just to to go with the cloud and, and get something um, put up in in a matter of weeks or months as opposed to months or years. Um, how, Tim, Tim, do you have any thoughts on that as, as, you, as you look at sort of the large providers or small providers and, and you know, who's more likely to invest in the cloud? Uh, well, I think that small providers might be more likely at first. Uh, just you know, emerging providers, it makes it much easier for them to launch. But uh, you know, the, the large service providers are, are getting their feet wet you know, with private cloud anyway have been, and have been doing that for a long time. So I think when they're comfortable with uh, – uh, public cloud that they're going to you know, be jumping into that in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see what else is coming in here. Um, so, um, Nava, you, you, here's here's a good question on um, integration, right? So, yeah. I, I yeah. know you, you you've seen this. Uh, as, as you've, you've been in the space for quite a while, what, what are the challenges? You know, people have invested a ton in, in their legacy on-premise infrastructures, and now people are investing in cloud infrastructure. Um, is, is there an integration challenge there? Okay, so you know, I get this question a lot because uh, it's, people find it a little bit uh, 
difficult to imagine, you know, how do you integrate an on-premise application with an application that is somewhere in the cloud? You know, where is the connector, the physical connector? So, so it's um, actually, you know, when we integrate uh, on-premise applications with on-demand cloud-based, web-based application, uh, it's very similar to integra integrating two on-premise application, and often it is even simpler. This is because the, the cloud applications, you know, they are already, uh, they live in the web, they have the standardized APIs, and it's more of a plug and play. So there are many uh, examples of integrations for our system, for, for, for your system, I'm sure. I, I remember that, you know, uh, something that Mark Benioff said about Salesforce.com that, that uh, let's say, six, seven years ago, most of uh, the transactions were actually people using the applications. And these days, over 50% of the transactions are API calls. That means one application uh, calling the Salesforce application, and that's you know most of it is is uh, or much of it is on-premise traditional applications. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We, I was just working with our tech ops team the other day, and we were, we were finding similar statistics with respect to how folks are using Zora, and the um, you know we're looking at the people who are clicking, for example, the subscribe and the upgrade button within the Zora application versus people who are calling the subscribe and the upgrade. Uh, uh, API calls, and and we're seeing it's the same thing. You know, roughly 50% uh, are, are operating through the API calls for either integration to existing systems or through a website, whatever it might be. Um, let's see. Oh, here's here's another great question that came in. Okay, so uh, you guys have described you know a cloud solution is being able to offer some advantage uh, over my competitors. Well, what happens when when everybody moves cloud? You know, and then how is it going to help me? Um, you know, it might, it's an interesting question. It, at the end of the day, you know, the, the technology you invest in, it is kind of an arms race. Um, but you know, the thing that I, the thing that I like about the, the cloud, particularly for the for the business users on the phone, is that it it just removes friction, right? And so in that case, then you're just competing based on, uh, you know, how how innovative you are with your with your services. And I'll go back to my example of um, my my buddy Brian, who's who's the CMO over at Elevate. Uh, you know, he says if if I want to crank out 20 new pricing plans and, and launch those next week, uh, it's something I can do, and I don't have to wait for. Uh, IT resources to come in and code that up for me. I can just do it. And so, you know, I see this as really being a path to to, to frictionless, you know, competition. And you're, then you're really only inhibited by, um, you know, the, the the service you provide and and how innovative you can be. Um, I don't know. Now, that you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, um, also, you know, SaaS software as a service uh, cloud, it's not new. It's like more than 10 years. And uh, I think initially. Uh, you couldn't configure it. It was uh, non-customizable, not non-configurable. And today, uh, the uh, level of uh, configuration that you can make, can make to the applications allow for any specific business processes that you need for your own businesses. It's, it's not uh, how it used to be, and I think it's one of the myths that uh, we need to bust, you know, to educate the market about. Yeah. Um, okay. So w with that, I, I do want to. I do want to. Draw this to an end. Um, I know we promised this would be about 45 minutes, and we run just a little bit over. But I know we we got started a little bit late. So um, any uh, when, when I turn it back to the panel, and, and first of all, uh, thank both of you so much for for participating today. Uh, and if you want contact information for for either of us, uh, it, their email addresses are available on the screen here. And if you're interested in learning more about what you can do with with BOSS or uh, Cvidia or Zora, um, the URLs are right there on the screen, and there'll be a follow up email that goes out to everybody as well, which will include a, a recording of this presentation so you can share it uh, with anyone else who, who may be interested. Um, and then we'll close it out. Tim, it, any, any closing thoughts from you? Uh, not just one. You know, I, uh, it kind of relates to that last question. And I, I, I just think about, you know, it's not about it. going to the cloud is not about a short-term advantage. It's more about lower cost of operations and flexibility and the price you pay for not doing it. So if you're worried about, you know, if I go to the cloud and I, uh, you know, how long do I have an advantage if everybody eventually gets on the cloud, um, you know, it's, it's about the efficient operation of your business and flexibility and, uh, and the price you pay if, you're not, if you don't do it. So I, I, yeah. I think, uh, you know, so, but uh, that's it. Great. Uh, Nava, any, any closing thoughts from you? So just, uh, you know, for the audience, uh, thanks for joining, and uh, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Kyle, for hosting you and Zora. Um, and I, I can, what I can I say, we are living in exciting times.
<laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so, yeah, thanks thanks to uh, again, the panelists again. Thanks to the audience. There, there were a bunch of questions coming in, so I apologize. We didn't get to all of them. Uh, we, we will keep a record of this and have someone follow up with you with, uh, with the specific answers as well. So, so thanks, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.